Behavioral Sciences. I am Arun Joseph, and I'm a graduate reading for DPhil in Clinical Neurosciences at the University of Oxford. And today I welcome Professor Andrew Farmery, my primary DPhil supervisor, to introduce today's topic and the speaker. Professor Farmery is a professor of anesthetics and head of Nuffield Department of Anesthetics. He's also Sir Samuel Scott of Hughes Fellow and tutor in medicine in Wadham College here in Oxford. So over to you, Professor Farmery. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, welcome you all to this uh, seminar um, and particularly to our speaker today, Sue McGowan. Uh, Sue works as a clinical specialist speech and language therapist at the National Hospital for Neurology, uh, known as Queen Square in London. I think we can say really that's our flagship neurological hospital in the UK. Uh, Sue's a clinician of 20 years experience um, um, uh, working in neurointensive care, particularly with an interest in tracheostomy and uh, weaning from ventilation. Um, she's going to be talking to us uh, uh, this afternoon about bulba function and its role in, um, uh, in, in ventilatory weaning success or otherwise. I think it's fair to say that most general ITUs are still overly fixated on lung mechanics as a, as a sort of judge of suitability for ventilator weaning. But in neurocritical care, um, there is a more enlightened approach to it in some respects, and bulbar function is something that deserves a lot of scrutiny. And Sue is going to share her experience with us uh, in a few moments, uh, particularly um, about what bulbar function and an assessment of bulbar function uh, can provide uh, in terms of information about readiness for uh, weaning and extubation. She'll be uh, debunking some myths uh, about um, the, um, weaning and extubation and introducing uh, new ways of assessing bulbar function, particularly fiber optic endoscopic evaluation. Um, so um, before I hand over to Sue, there's just a couple of uh, housekeeping points I need to mention. One is that this uh, meeting is being recorded. Uh, so please, I think probably your mics are already off, but make sure they are. Um, and if you have any questions, could you address them in the chat to Jacqueline Pumphrey, who's the host, or to Aaron, and they will go through those uh, towards the end and read them out to Sue. So uh, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Sue McGowan. Thanks very much, Prof, for that introduction. And thank you very much to Aaron for the invitation to speak today. It's been an absolute pleasure to be invited and to speak. And um, I really look forward to hearing any of your questions that you've got. Let me share my screen. Okay, so Aaron asked me to speak about what is the impact of dysphagia and dysphonia in long-term ventilation weaning and extubation in neurocritical care. So the topics that I'm going to cover today are what is the impact of dysphagia on weaning? What about early cuff deflation? What factors should we consider? Why is it so important? How do we look at secretion, oral secretion management? How, what are the techniques that we could use and the adjuncts that we could use to make that a safer experience for the patient? And what about dysphonia and extubation failure? And then, and the link between those two. And then we're going to look at post-extubation dysphagia and its dysphonia, dysphonia in this population. Just a word firstly on the evidence. So across all studies that, I've, that I'm aware of, there is the risk of bias, uh, as well as um, study design limitations. Prof Nyquist in his lecture for this series, the first lecture, acknowledged that this was the case in fact in, in most ITU research anyway. So it's a lot of art and a little bit of science based on clinical experience. And so what we end up with is some evidence-based practice, but mostly practice-based evidence. 
But here in the UK, we also have some national bodies and some societies who have helped our work enormously by coming together to facilitate multidisciplinary good safe care and recommendations. So we have the guidelines for the provision of intensive care service working with the um, pr pr being produced by the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, the Intensive Care Society, together coming together with a National Tracheostomy Safety Project to produce guidance. And then of course, the remarkable resource on the tracheostomy website itself, the National Tracheostomy Safety Project website. So we have a lot of help to guide safe, our safe work. So why bother about bulbar dysfunction? Well, we know that there is a high frequency of dysphagia in the critical care population. So in neurologic conditions, certainly more than 40% and up to 83% has been shown for some years now to be the case. And we know that dysphagia increases the risk of related complications. So we know that this is aspiration, malnutrition, none of this is a surprise to you. Reduced quality of life, extended ICU and hospitals length of stay, increased morbidity and mortality, and risk of disuse atrophy with other comorbidities, especially COPD, and then recently with, with COVID. So what causes bulbar problems in the neurocritically ill? I think it's important to say from the outset that teasing out the relationship of primary bulbar problems to other common factors causing dysphagia in critically ill patients is quite difficult. But anyway, let's start. Well, there's direct impairment, of course, from the primary neurological diagnosis, whether that's centrally, such as strokes, Parkinson's, whether that's due to traumatic peripheral nerve damage or the primary neuromuscular junction abnormalities, for instance, myasthenia gravis. Critical illness neuropathy is a frequent thing we see in neurological ITU. It's often seen after the ITU treatment of sepsis and other cardiac and other surgery. And these patients show this flaccid tetraplegia and prolonged weaning ventilations. And then in terms of other causes of bulbar problems, well, of course, there's the effect of medication as per other critical illness patients. So Sedborg et al. in 2015 showed some nice work looking at the contribution of morphine and midazolam and found that those two medications were associated with increased risk of pharyngeal dysfunction and discoordination between breathing and swallowing. So this impaired airway protection and potentially increased the risk of pulmonary aspiration. So these sedatives actively altered pharyngeal function. It's not just that the patient wasn't alert enough to swallow. And similarly, benzodiazepines and other, other medication, ketamine, depress laryngeal reflexes and cause aspiration. And we also know about the effects of sedatives on delirium and agitation, and that increases patients' risks of laryngeal injury as they pull on tubes, and that may delay oral trials. And also swallow issues caused by the cognitive difficulties and side effects of these medications, such as swallow problems such as oral holding and impulsivity. We know that for other critical illness patients too, there is diminished laryngeal sensory function caused by prolonged intubation causing bulbar problems. There's injury, direct injury to the vocal cords, which I'll show you later. And then there's this learned non-use that happens of swallowing muscles with reduced functional muscular reserve, especially in the old age group and decompensation. And a well-documented dyssynchrony between respiration and swallowing. So this much needed apneic pause during swallowing is interfered with and decompensated due to respiratory uh, dysrhythmia, this dyssynchrony between respiration and swallowing during the ventilator cycling. And the other risk factors are the length or duration of intubation and mechanical ventilation. So Scorz et al in 2014 showed that the endotracheal tube itself causes laryngeal injury 
um, and impairs laryngeal coordination and that the patient odds of dysphagia are two to one for every 12 hours of intubation. So we have enough of a cause for bulb problem. As Prof said, I, th I thought it would be useful to debunk a couple of myths, and I'm sure there may be more out there, but these are the, th the two that I could come across. First of all, myth number one is why bother to deflate the cuff? Come on, you're just going to cause de-recruitment, prolong the wean, and we're trying to get these patients off ventilators, and you're just going to keep them on them for longer. Well, as early as 2004, so nearly 20 years ago, um, Conway and Mackey showed produced this paper which showed that even just with cuff deflation, there were clinically insignificant decreases in end expiratory pressure for patients. And then in 2013 and 2019, these authors showed that early cuff deflation actually decreased intensive care unit length of stay and shortened the wean time. And then Sutt, um, who's been a prolific um, contributor to this, this debunking um, has shown that, and Freeman Sanderson in 2016, has shown that the use of a speaking valve in line was safe with no additional adverse events and no impact on duration of mechanical ventilation or tracking. And then furthermore, um, in a cohort of other critically ill ventilated patients using electrical impedance tomography, Sutt and colleagues showed that there was improved end expiratory lung impedance when using a valve with mechanical ventilation in the cardiothoracic population, but specifically that valves did not cause de-recruitment of the lungs and actually improved gas distribution, improved alveolar recruitment. And further studies in 27 the further data that they published showed that hyperinflation didn't occur either with speaking valve use. So we can't not deflate the cuff because we're worried about de recruitment. There's too much evidence to say that this doesn't happen with careful, selected, judicious use of cuff deflation programs. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. The second myth is, well, we can't deflate the cuff because there's far too many upper airway secretions which prevent cuff deflation. And this could be upper airway and or oral secretions. Well, yes, this may be a sign of profound bulbar dysfunction, but secretions can be managed with adjuncts and I'll go through some of those later. And actually restoring translaryngeal supraglottic airflow through cuff deflation and using a one-way valve may do a number of things. It can help sensory awareness and therefore management of that secretions with that sensory motor feedback loop. And, it, and in that feedback loop can, can help with reflexive swallows. And then it allows you to treat directly cough effectiveness, to work with physiotherapy colleagues to help you treat cough effectiveness, to help you treat um, and teach throat clearing strategies and other swallow effectiveness work. And using um, a cuff down and one way valve restores auto peep so that you get that glottic closure that you need to promote good voicing and good swallow safety. If airway secretions are prolific and, and are difficult to manage, you could use a Portex suction aid. And I think this is now becoming very common in neuro ITUs and other ITUs. But for those of you who don't know it, um, I just have a picture here. Um, circled is this beautiful port above the cuff, which can be used to aspirate or withdraw secretions that collect on top of the cuff. And yes, of course, if secretions are collecting on top of the cuff, then this by default is aspiration. But I'll show you in a minute how using this tube can allow you to assess patients' airway patency, their propensity for swallowing, their propensity for speech. Um, and we'll go through that in, in the next slide. But just to say also within the UK guidance from these, these societies actually, the advice is 
we've got to use these subglottic suction tracheostomy tubes kind of as standard. So, so, so let's get with it, Let, let's use them because they do facilitate great care. So one way that um, we help have used these, this tube is to reverse the airflow that goes from the, above the cuff. So let me explain. Using this technique, we can call it above cuff vocalization where the cuff stays inflated. So when the cuff is inflated, the secretions collect on top of the cuff and the secretions can be withdrawn using often a syringe or, free, or continual low level suctioning. If you reverse the airflow into the subglottic suction line, there's nowhere for the air to go other than transglottically, supraglottically, and then out of the mouth. So that allows secretions here to be moved. It restores airflow and it restores sensation to the laryngeal area. And this has been shown by McGrath and Wallace um, a couple of years ago to be safe, to be well tolerated in ventilator dependent critical care patients and to help with earlier and more effective communication and improving laryngeal function and, and rehab. And I've used it uh, myself and um, to varying effects, but it's a, an excellent first line bit of thing up your sleeve to use if you have this tube. And Sarah Wallace has very kindly shared with me a clip with a, showing a patient who's using, there is no sound here, using the above cuff vocalization. So the cuff is inflated, the air is flowing up through the cords, which is where you can see the, the secretions bubbling up. And slowly the airflow is being increased to about five liters. And in a minute, there we go, you see a lovely clear um, airway where the secretions have been moved and can be spat out of the mouth and you can now restore um, vocal cord function and sensation. So it shows the effect really, that has shown the effect of providing the airflow up through the, the larynx with the cuff inflated and in clearing pooled secretions. So when is a patient ready for cuff deflation? This is a question I'm commonly asked and not helped because really there's, there are a lack of kind of really tight clinical guidelines that have been published through the evidence. But UK societies have published guidelines and essentially what they say is, look, cuff deflation should be a goal of routine care with, with patients. I think the key thing though, is that you, you certainly need your local clinical consensus from your physiotherapy colleagues, your anesthetists, um, your neurologists, your neurosurgeons, anyone who kind of contributes to, to the patient um, care. And specifically, we think about things like cough strength and oral secretion load. But as with everything, what we're trying to do is rather than write rigid protocols, we're trying to think about individualized care. So we're talking about this art of judicious, careful consideration, which is specifically tailored to that patient at that time on that day. And often I'm asked, how early can you deflate somebody's cuff? You know, what about high levels of pressure support? Well, with, with some changes and some tweaks to the ventilator, which I'll go through, we, you can do cuff deflation quite early, again, after this judicious conversation with your team. And we do use cuff deflation on patients with a reduced level of consciousness. That's most of my patient group. And the aim there is for a wean rather than for communication. So we thought we should um, put our money where our mouth is and just show um, the world what we have developed at Queen's Square through collaboration with my neurophysiotherapy and neuroanesthetic colleagues, uh, where we have present, prevented, pre developed a protocol for a, dis a kind of decision-making tool for cuff deflation. I'm not going to go through this um, in great detail. You can come to the conference and see it on the poster. But really what we've tried to do is to draw a diagram which incorporates all the discussion that we have. 
um, and allows there to be this judicious, careful selection of patients. So we think about our aim, is our aim communication? Is it the prognosis of the wean? Is it wanting to provide laryngeal wean or a mixture of three thing, those three things? We ask some questions, but if there's a no, we don't necessarily finish on not currently suitable for cuff deflation. We also proceed at risk with the agreement of the MDT. We have thought about some numbers here. These numbers are specific to our neurosurgical ITU patient group, uh, which basically indicate patients who are being weaned and who are off um, the kind of most, the earliest stage of ventilation. But they're not numbers that we um, are evidence-based, they're not numbers that we hold too rigidly. They're just a guide for us in our patient group. And we talk about things like our secretions well-managed and if not, how they can be before we, we proceed. The physiotherapists measure the, the cough and, and look at their negative flow rate during the cough maneuver. So we have a lot of things up our sleeve to think about in terms of when somebody might be ready according to our wean. And then we have a protocol of what we do, the kind of an A, B and C. And really importantly, in the first cuff deflation, we will place a one-way valve in line. And I cannot say how important that is. We also make some ventilator, ventilator adjunct amendments. So we reduce the PEEP by five and we reduce the trigger to minus two. Um, this is to make the um, tolerance of the valve in line more comfortable for the patient. Um, and again, this is a, a well-documented procedure in our institution. Everybody knows what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if somebody doesn't think the patient will be able to tolerate that, they, they'll speak up and we'll, we may try different things. What's really important is that once the, the cuff is down and the valve is in line, we assess the patients for this tolerance. So we look at breath flow out the mouth, we look at airway patency, phonation, if they can make a sound, otherwise just uh, vocalizations, if they're just using the cords uh, reflexively. We look at secretion management, reflexive swallowing and airway protection. So th that's our kind of protocol trying to synthesize really what we do in our in our patient group but but I can't say it enough this is not something to follow rigidly in your institution this is something to develop to reflect the discussions that you're having with your team so once we've got the cuff deflation how does the one-way valve fit in line uh, on the ventilators so you can see here there's the closed circuit suction coming off at the same angle to the trachea. Then coming off to the side at a 45 degree is the one-way valve that we use in line, which is the Passy Muir valve. It does not come with this connector. We have to go and find it from the back of the storeroom. And here we're showing a female, female 22 millimeter connector to the ventilator tubing. And obviously the cuff is as flat as a pancake. So that's a just one setup um, showing how we use the valve in line. We also use the valve in line for uh, non-invasive ventilators. So these are for patients maybe who have a, a, a progressive diagnosis. These were two patients with motor neuron disease. And it's a very similar setup, but this is showing the female-female connector, and this is showing a female-to-male 22 to 15 connector. And this, these differ in different institutions, but this is kind of what we, we use, either one or two of those. We also use a one-way valve um, with other types of non-invasive ventilators and other ventilators and other modes. So we use one-way valves with the V60 ventilators on the NIV mode. I like this ventilator because it has auto compensation for when the cuff is down. So there's no alarm leak, no constant turning off of the alarm. And we use the synchronized time mode to make it more comfortable for the patient. Scorts in 2017 and, and her colleagues have done some lovely primary work in the area of high flow, um, not via trachea. 
but she's been looking at high flow and she's been looking at the influence of respiratory mechanics in healthy adults and its effect on laryngeal vestibular closure. Now it's worth saying that these patients whom she's looking at or who we hope to affect are, as you would understand, medically quite fragile. So trying to work out the unique contribution, either positive or negative, of interventions like high flow to a swallow or respiratory system is difficult. And there aren't any studies that I'm aware of yet looking at the impact of high flow on swallowing functions in tracky patients. But um, watch this space, because I, I think things are coming. I think high flow is certainly used so much more in the second round of COVID patients that we had. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some studies from that. And suffice to say, here we go, we have a, we use the fischer pakel system. So it comes with a Trekkie mask interface adapter, which fits nicely onto the end of a passimur valve. And then there's the tracky hidden behind this gentleman's beard. Neurally adjusted ventilatory assist is a proportional ventilatory mode. It uses the electrical activity of the diaphragm to, to offer kind of ventilatory assistance in proportion to patient effort. Now we've used uh, valves with NAVA. To my knowledge, there's been absolutely no research on this. Um, one of our colleagues in this area thinks that may the valve may help with um, the diaphragmatic trigger when you're using a valve with, with um, the NAVA. We don't know, Let, let's see, perhaps one of you lot out there can start some research on that, highly needed. I think I just wanted to finish this slide with um, one of the, the risks, maybe this should have been a myth, but one of the risks of passing away, which is when people have used a valve and then they've, it's gone horrendously wrong. And um, it's just how to mitigate that and what measures to put in place. So of, often the recorded or observed risks are there's no airflow out of the mouth and and or the, the valve is used with the cuff inflated. So obviously you need very good thought through protocols as well as careful judicious eyes on the patient, um, hands to feel breath coming out of the mouth. Um, and it's just worth saying that if, in my experience with judicious use of the, a one-way valve such as Passimur valve, we haven't had a problem which has been overwhelming and of course has caused us to stop using them at all. So with careful measures to put in place of checking patency, I think one way valves are the way to go in terms of using them in line. So what are the, what are the benefits then? So if I think that, why? Why would, why would I try to insist on early cuff deflation and placement of a one way valve? Well, we know that one-way valves um, and early cuff deflation assists the wean. We know that, we've, we've, we've seen some of the evidence for that. And really more importantly, I find that immediately the cuff is down and the valve is on, I'm getting information straight away that I can feed back to the team on factors that might affect or prolong or improve the laryngeal wean, such as ability to be aware of, of sensate of, of the secretions, their, their cough strength, their cough effectiveness, lots of things that will tell me how is this patient going to wean? What, is, what are the factors going to be affecting that? Of course, speech is a huge benefit of early cuff deflation where the patients can speak and concomitant psychological benefit. Smell also is restored. And prioritizing the treatment and management of the larynx is one key benefit because you pro provide that translaryngeal airflow, you re-sensate the larynx and you can start your treatment as a therapist, that's what we need to do. Obviously with a valve on, if the patient can communicate, we can get a much better assessment of pain, the extent of their delirium and extent of any cognitive communication disorders, especially important after our treatment of, of COVID patients with their prolonged intubation and prolonged medication they were given. And then these authors have shown that there is some nice improvement of most swallowing parameters. There are some small neurological patient groups within these um, papers 
uh, really in the last um, coming up to a decade, showing some nice changes to, to swallowing uh, with, the, with the placement of a one-way valve. What about um, leak speech alone? Well, one of the problems, if you just deflate the cuff, the, the speech quality is awful. Um, patients can't really regulate the, the loudness, the volume of their speech. They, they have a much shorter time to, to speak as the ventilator kicks in to, to reestablish a better cycle. There are long pauses. And um, as I said, the voice quality is awful, but perhaps more importantly, there's no auto peep. So with an open valve system, there's no ability to generate good subglottic pressure for, for voicing and for cough. So some people have said, well, you can mitigate this by increasing the peep again, judiciously for selected patients. And sometimes when I've been unable to use a valve, for very few patients that, that has helped, but most 99% of, of my patients, we can use a valve on. And this gives you so much more information than leak speech alone. The problem is with just leak speech, you don't know what the effect is on the lungs. So there is a lack of guidance out there to, to try and help us with, with improving the lot for, for leak speech. So really, I think my bottom line is, try to avoid leak speech and use a one-way valve where at all possible. What about troubleshooting in this weaning period? And what about things to consider? Well, some just some opening comments, really, as you would, would expect, that troubleshooting is always a, a multidisciplinary team discussion through um, tracheostomy ward rounds that we start on ITU the day that the trachea is inserted. Um, we need to, as a team, weigh up the patient's goals for speech with the need for a ventilatory wean. We need to weigh up those goals to avoid fatigue, which might, so prolonged speaking might impact on ventilatory wean, and that fatigue might get you in trouble with all your other colleagues. So you've got your patient speaking, but actually at what cost? So we need to help patients conserve energy for the most important part of their ITU stay, which is to wean them off the ventilator. So we need to time those cuff deflation trials and the laryngeal wean trials in with an almost with, with this bigger in amongst this bigger ITU picture. What about troubles when you're using a one-way valve? And the biggest problem I've I've face with and I'm asked about is where oral secretions are prolific. Well, obviously, you reduce aspiration risk where you can do. Um, and these anti have been uh, well documented to be useful. So a mixture of, of one or three of these, depending on your patient group and the pharmacy advice and uh, medical advice. So sublingual atropine, so eye drops given underneath the tongue. And then systemic anticholinergic, such as hyacin, um, glycopyrrolate, either subcut or, or IV, and or, so not only systemic glycopyrrolate, but we've tried topical as well into the, the, the mucosal uh, area of the, sorry, to cause a mucosal block within the, the, the mouth. And then later on down the line, of course, you've got an, potentially an option of Botox, saliva gland Botox under um, image ultrasound guidance. Um, and in my experience, this has been a bit hit and miss where it's worked, it's worked beautifully, but sometimes it hasn't worked at all. And of course it needs to be repeated for those intractable aspiration type of prolific uh, secretion production patients. It's important where there are a lot of oral secretions to make a distinction therapeutically and from a treatment perspective between poor sensation, um, where there may not be any awareness of the pooled secretions versus hypersensitivity to secretions. So hypersensitivity might be characterized by irritant and irritant constant cough, which just doesn't do anything effective. And sometimes with that, you might want to do a 
partial cuff deflation before you put the one-way valve on just to allow patients to experience that translaryngeal airflow. And if, if it's a poor sensation issue, you might want to just teach the patient to, um, to give them some visual imagery about how, what, what's occurring or to have to limit the amount of time that they have the valve on. Um, but certainly don't just not treat them. You know, if there's poor sensation, it needs to be treated somehow by, by that laryngeal airflow. Obviously lower respiratory tract infections um, must be treated. And um, if you do have the subglottic, the suction aid portex tube in situ, you can increase the frequency of your subglottic suctioning, so prophylactically prior to cuff deflation, but also occasionally you could consider putting free, uh, consistent, continuous subglottic suctioning when the cuff is deflated to kind of catch any aspirated secretions. But of course, this is a very, very low level of, of continuous suctioning because you want to avoid high suctioning of high pressures there. Um, because of the, the, the kind of negative effect of drawing stuff, drawing air out of the lungs. Obviously, for these patients, I've talked about um, above cuff vocalization and how that might help to get rid of retained laryngopharyngeal secretions. And for this, this patient group, I will maybe see them for two or three times a day for one or two minutes each with or without physiotherapy colleagues, just to say, let's have a go with put the cuff down, one way valve on, and let's teach you to do some better coughs, right, cuff back up again. And certainly for some of my Guillain-Barre patients, that's been a very effective therapeutic strategy to teach them to deal with their oral secretions. What about a problem when using a one way valve of no upper expiratory airflow? Well, first of all, how is this manifest? Well, it might be that you put the cuff down and the vent doesn't register a leak. Or it might be that you don't feel any air coming out of their mouth using the very sensitive part of your, your what's this, your wrist. Um, it's really important if there is no upper expiratory airflow, one, to identify it quickly and remove that valve straight away. And then to think, okay, what's causing this? Is it an airway patency issue? And we'll see some slides in a minute, which might give us some indication about what, how that might be impacted. Or is it the tube size or a bit of both? So that needs to be looked at and that needs to be identified quickly. So sometimes if it is just the tube size, a smaller tube can help if that's OK in terms of ventilatory pressures for the patient if they're still being ventilated. Excessive coughing is very common, especially in the first couple of times of cuff deflation for these neurocritically care, neurocritically ill patients. And so for these patients, I might do a pre-cuff deflation prophylactic suction. I might just go really slow, so take 10 minutes to deflate the cuff, or just do partial cuff deflation before placing the valve. Obviously, what you want to try to avoid in this hypersensitivity of excessive coughing is any vomiting and aspiration of vomitus. So, but in my opinion, in my experience, after the third or fourth time of trying, often patients learn to suppress appropriately this hyper irritant cough. Although with one young lass with uh, Guillaume Barry, it took us about a month, but she's, she was an anomaly, but we got there a month of careful slow cuff deflation. The other problem could be desaturation. So uh, during now that, you know, you need to look at why the desaturation, but just very briefly pre-oxygenation if appropriate for that patient and further oxygen therapy during the time of cuff deflation, again, if appropriate for that patient. Prof mentioned that I would be talking about fees and indeed you can't have a talk by a speech therapist on critical care or swallowing without mentioning fees these days. And so for the last couple of decades, we're really grateful to those who, those pioneers who've shown its am amazing utility as a diagnostic tool in ITU um, during and after intubation. And it helps has helped us to diagnose swallowing and laryngeal problems, um, to help treatment, to guide treatment, and to optimize decisions about timing, about outcome of decannulation. So um, 
with or without your ENT colleagues, fees can be a very useful tool to assess form and functions. So form, what is the larynx doing? What are the arytenoids doing? Is there any subluxation? And then how does the, the, the whole structure respond to airflow? What's the function when you ask the patient to swallow, to cough, to speak? These is performed at bedside. It can really accurately detect silent aspiration. Um, it allows you to look at the sensation awareness of the patient within the larynx. Obviously, you've got this beautiful bird's eye view here of the epiglottis, the whole larynx, the arytenoid, the cords, with the pharynx. And there has been shown to be high interrater reliability with people using fees. So it's, it's a tool that can be um, relied on. Which um, is backed by the uh, UK societies that basically say you've got to really use fees um, if you're doing if you want to rehabilitate the swallow in, in any patient, not just your neuro, neurogenic patient. Um, so we've got some 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 good advice and recommendations from these national societies to say fees in ITU is becoming very important and um, with some lovely effects on, on outcome management. So we, we must we must avail ourselves of these of these tubes. And they're not it's not an expensive tool compared with the expense of keeping a patient on an ITU for a day, I can assure you. OK. One thing that I was discussing with Erin uh, is about how do we to know when people are ready to be extubated in a, a neurocritical care unit? So often, you know, on the round, I'm asked with my physio colleagues, what, what is, you know, how soon do you think this patient is to be extubated? So we look at as a team, the tube tolerance, how aware, how they're comfortable are they, off sedation, how comfortable are they? And if they're there kind of moving the tube from corner of the mouth to corner of the mouth to get a better view of the paper, then you know that you're in for a problem potentially in terms of the, that, that poor airway sensation. We're looking at the extent and management of oral secretion. So if there's a kind of a river running out of their mouth, um, we might think, well, that's a sign of bulb or dysfunction. Is there any other way I can look at swallow frequency, swallow uh, can I feel, can I hear the swallows to see how well are they managing those oral secretions, albeit with an ET tube in? And can we try to dry them up a little bit before extubation is considered? Colleagues here do a cuff leak test on the ventilator. And at this point, this is where the team can come in and say, oh, actually, I don't think they're going to be ready for extubation. And I think we're going to be heading for a trachea. And actually, can we please use the subglottic tube because we think they're going to have a high secretion load? Laryngeal ultrasound measures the difference in the width of the air column with cuff inflated and deflated. And this is an emerging tool, mostly in the research arena at the moment, used for pre-extubation and post-extubation. And this can help predict laryngeal edema, strider and vocal cord immobility. So we look forward to papers that, that, that show how, we can, uh, how well we can rely on this tool. So, the patient has been um, extubated. And um, let's talk about now about post-extubation dysphagia. So the tubing alone, so this is ET tubing and tracheal tubing, accounts for weak tongue base retraction. So we know that because the ET tube sits on the base of the tongue for prolonged periods. We know that there's mucosal trauma. We know that the tubing causes impaired sensation in that whole laryngopharyngeal area. And we know that there are vocal cord issues. And there are, there are a lack of clinical guidelines now for laryngeal assessment in this post extubation surveillance. But the NTSP has come in here and go, guys, you must look at this, um, this post extubation dysphagia that's very serious. So um, Sarah Wallace and Brenda McGrath in, in just this year have published a beautiful paper, which has, with their permission, I've uh, put up this picture in their paper of the areas within the laryngopharynx that are responsible for causing these traumatic effects, which contribute to the development of swallowing and, and voice problems. And, uh, you know, up to 93% of patients within a neurocritical care population can have laryngeal injury. So this is a, this is a big problem. 
um, and we, we really need to be careful to look at these and that here's where your fees and all your ENT help for scoping comes, comes in. So we know that there's edema, can cause dislocation of the cartilages, necrosis, granulation, trachomalacia, subglottically nerve palsies, and then direct problems with edema on the cords, stenosis, granulation, paralysis, dislocation of the um, cricoid or, or arotenoid um, cartilages. So, so we know that there's a, a plethora of problems really that, that cause post-extubation dysphagia. And what about post-extubation dysphonia? Well, again, high numbers, a high percentage after prolonged intubation, up to 83% with all the things that we've talked about earlier. And nearly two thirds of COVID patients have been dysphonic post-extubation. And again, these people, Regan, Clooney, Wallace and McGrath have all produced papers this year on their COVID cohorts showing this. Um, and really what they've put it down to is prolonged periods of intubation, the impact of proning, prolonged cuff inflation, probably due to the concerns with cuff deflation due to uh, aerosol generating procedures, and um, the apparent potential of, of the SARS-CoV-2 to directly cause airway edema and laryngitis. And we know that this persists beyond ITU. So this dysphonia is something that is really important to identify and be aware of. And of course, with the dual diagnosis of COVID and neurologic changes such as myopathy and polyneuropathy and a stroke, there is the high risk of bulbar and dysphonic changes to this patient group. So it's something we really need to be aware of. So how to treat dysphagia? Well, we do have some targeted behavioral interventions up our sleeves, but needless to say, the evidence is there are only, only a few intervention studies with small sample sizes. But there's emerging evidence from things like the expiratory muscle strength training, EMST, Lee Silverman voice training to predominantly a Parkinson's group in terms of the impact of voice training on swallowing and neuromuscular electrical stimulation. But I think the one that for me provides the most hope is pharyngeal electrical stimulation where, where you have transnasal catheters which stimulate the pharynx directly. Now the, the, this is thought to improve swallowing performance with this neurogenic dysphagia group by increasing corticobulbar excitability and inducing cortical reorganization of the swallowing motor cortex, which is amazing. And these papers um, have shown uh, particularly that uh, for a group of patients with, with stroke here, and then for a Guillain-Barre patient, um, and particularly for this, in this paper, they had a, a large cohort of patients who were ventilated um, and who'd had a tracheostomize and they were stroke neurogenic patients and PEZ facilitated decannulation with them. Um, and it's also been shown by other authors to be safe, to, to improve oropharyngeal dysphagia and to reduce the penetration aspiration risk. So this is exciting data. So let's, let's hope there's some more studies out there. As speech and language therapists who treat dysphagia in other patient groups, we have other compensatory strategies um, and to do with swallow, timing, swallow textures, we, we use postural changes. And really the point is use, we use all those, we have all those as kind of battery of things up our sleeve. But the key thing is to, to optimize the treatment so that we, we, we work, start early with patients who are tracheostomized to, provide, to try and prevent this disuse atrophy. And of course, there's the importance of, of oral hygiene. So finally, just my last couple of slides, what do patients think? Well, we know that communication difficulties are one of the main sources of frustration while ventilated. So we must get our patients speaking. We know that there's social withdrawal, they, they, patients can't and, and participate poorly in their care. Uh, they get stressed, they're anxious, poor sleep-wake cycle patterns. So we behove it to our patients to, to, to them to improve their lot on ITU, to encourage this early cuff deflation and use of speaking valves or one-way valves as routine, and to continue our kind of prosization of, of myth debunking, to encourage more research, 
and some lovely videos have been produced on the tracheostomy.org.uk website, uh, which give this patient testimonials of using valves, so it's worth having a look at. And in terms of future directions, well, it's, it's quite important to, to think about this as individualized care, to use this, the basic methods and, and uh, theories and evidence that we have, but then to, to, to make sure that those are primed and channeled and funneled to individualized care. So not every single patient is suitable for cuff deflation and one-way valve. And therefore for those who aren't, what are your options? And there's ACV that's come in to help us. Um, Teamwork with patients as part of the team is really important future direction. So at the center, informing the research question, informing the outcome measurement tool is the patient and, and identifying their goals for themselves where they can do and a neuro ITU is absolutely important. Early intervention is crucial for these patients and we must involve patients and families more in their research. So that's the end of my presentation. And I just wanted to thank again, Aaron, very much for the opportunity to present today. And um, back to you, Prof Farmery. Hello. Um, I think there's lots of rays um, through my window, <laughs> but thank you so much, Sue, uh, for your inspiring talk. And it also emphasizes how much the expertise of speech and language therapists are needed to make crucial decisions around weaning us for this extubation. So thank you so much for that. Um, especially when it came to clinical consensus from MDT in terms of cuff deflation trials as well as extubation, uh, it's quite important. And some of the research points that I found fascinating, especially the use of um, in applications of NAVA, as well as ultrasound of larynx, as well as the pharyngeal stimulation, uh, those things could be quite groundbreaking uh, in terms of how we can improve post-extubation as well as pre-extubation in this population. But you have condensed your 20 years of clinical experience so well for us uh, within this hour. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, one from Hannah McMahon, who asks, is there a 24 hour volume of subglottic secretions that would indicate to not complete cup deflation? So I just think that they're asking if um, the amount of subglottic secretions in terms of 24 hour volume measure is a good indicator or not. Thank you, that's a really good question. I'm aware of one paper in Adelaide, I think it's Prior et al. Who who um, would indicate have indicated that there is a, a volume of secretions above which it's not safe to deflate the cuff. Um, I don't think that was for a neuro population group, and I don't know where that was in terms of their ventilatory wean process. Um, uh, I think you probably just need to stand back and look at the clinical relevance of that question, which is a really good question. Um, so my question would be, um, can you get on my, my kind of the way I'd answer it is, can you get on top of those secretions? Um, what is the effect of those secretions? And um, do the secretions need to be managed by your adjuncts in order for you to proceed? So in other words, would you just leave somebody with, with high volumes of above cuff secretion retention? Um, we generally wouldn't, we'd treat, we'd treat them so that we could get on and, and deflate the cuff. So there's no cutoff as far as I'm concerned. And um, as I said, you, you could potentially think about good prophylactic suction and judicious careful use of low pressures of continual suction when the cuff is down in order to capture and catch those aspirated secretions. Thank you. Um, uh, there is another brave question from Hannah Jones Reynolds, who says, is there a clinical reason why you couldn't start cup deflation on the day of insertion? Uh, wouldn't pressures impact on stoma site and bleeding, et cetera? Yeah, um, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, we always wait. We don't want to cause um, any problems with, uh, um, you know, post-operative um, air being caught under, under freshly scarred uh, tissue. 
Um, so yes, we would be careful. And I guess it depends on how traumatic that was. It might be difficult for surgical versus a perk, but generally speaking, we wait a day or two. Thank you. Uh, and I think there is a follow up question from that. How long would you normally wait to assess the impact of anticholinergics? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd be guided by medical and pharma pharmacy colleagues um, for that particular patient. Um, and um, but I'd, I'd expect probably within a day or two, maybe maximum of three or four days to see differences. Obviously, if it's topical, topical glycopyrrolate will have an immediate effect. Um, and um, depending on the strength, if it's subcut of glycopyrrolate, how much is used and how uh, often during the day, whether it's OD, TDS or QDS, um, might impact uptake and effect. So um, probably wait a day or two and then try again. But you'll be seeing the manifestation of any adjunct, won't you, in terms of the effects of any adjunct. Um, by the at the bedside in order to help guide you on your timing. In other words, less drooling. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Ema Swingwood. Uh, do Sue and her team ever use uh, OWE one-way valve in dual limb uh, slash invasive ventilators and modes? Um, we don't have those here. Um, we use uh, servo I, servo use here. I don't know, maybe somebody, maybe a physiotherapist who uses one way valves can answer that question or an anaesthetist can answer that question better. Um, I'm not aware of any research saying don't, um, but it, yeah, give it a try. Thank you. Um, there's a question around suction pressure. So what suction pressure would you recommend for continuous subglottic suction during cuff deflation, uh, especially where high secretion load is an issue? So just to say, I'm not recommending this as a routine thing. Um, I'm just recommending it as something to have up your sleeve to consider, because sometimes even with very low pressures of su subglottic suction pressure, it can make the patient gag. So being very careful, judicious, I, I would just put, I would turn it to an absolute minimum just to see it ha if it has any impact. And it may be that, that you can um, do that better. So during cuff deflation, just with a quick check every now and then of, of secretions. But of course, secretions won't sit nicely on top of a deflated cuff. So the idea with this continual suctioning is that you're catching watery, salivary secretions that just run down the cuff. But you know what? You're, you're, um, you need to look at patient's tolerance, how they're reacting, if they're gagging, if they're coughing, if they find it uncomfortable. And again, being very careful not to put those airway pressures up too high because you don't know, obviously you're drawing air out of, out of the lungs. So you're kind of doing the opposite of what the ventilator is doing. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm not gonna give you a number. I'm just gonna say very, very low. Okay, um, I think that's all uh, the questions and I'll hand over to Professor Farmery to conclude our session. Oh, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, I was just reminded whilst listening to Sue's talk that uh, I'm sitting in my room in, in Wadham College in Oxford and in this room 400 years ago met uh, those post-enlightenment natural philosophers who formed the Royal Society, people like Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke and Wilkins and Boyle, and in this room planned experiments. And the experiments that they planned uh, included a, a number of physiological experiments, including the first endotracheal intubation in a dog, the first tracheostomy and mechanical ventilation in a dog. So I was thinking to myself, how wonderful that 400 years later, the ghosts, the portraits are on the wall here, of these great pioneers have listened to such an erudite exposition of the state of the art that Sue has given to us this afternoon. And I'm very grateful to that, uh, as I'm sure you all are too. So uh, thanks very much to Sue for such a wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank you also to Jackie uh, for hosting it and Aaron for organizing it. And thank you all, all 
uh, hundred and odd of you uh, um, for tuning in and listening to it. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.